Good morning, everybody. The mic's on. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the eighth ECB Annual Research Conference. My name is Simone Manganelli. I'm the head of the Financial Research Division. And uh, in this uh, early morning session, we're going to have two papers. Each paper is allocated uh, 50 minutes, 25 for the presenter, 15 for the discussion, and 10 minutes for general discussion. And the first paper is by Francesca Zucchi, and uh, it's going to talk about innovation, industry equilibrium, and discount rates. Francesca. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, first of all, to the conference organizer for including the paper uh, in this uh, program. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Cecilia Bustamante at the University of Maryland, and uh, I'm at the ECB, so I should start by saying that the views expressed are uh, our own. Okay, so two basic facts motivate this paper. The first is the uh, standard tenant in corporate finance that discount rate affect corporate decision. And uh, the literature has gone uh, one step further over the past decades and uh, has realized that they don't just affect corporate decision, but also affect aggregate outcome. For instance, um, it has been found that fluctuation in the aggregate risk premium are key drivers of uh, IPO waves, of merger uh, and uh, buyout activity, or uh, more recently, are has been found by several papers that uh, fluctuation in, uh, in the aggregate risk premium are key drivers of the dynamics of employment and unemployment. The second fact is that R&D is a very long-term investment. So R&D, first of all, has become increasingly important in the economy we, we, we live in uh, because it has become a, a, an innovation-driven economy. As, uh, emphasized by many paper and uh, also as emphasized by Deutsche Kale Carolin's tools, uh, listed firms um, are engages, engaging over, uh, over time more in uh, R&D than uh, in CapEx. Um, and a distinctive feature of R&D as opposed to physical investment is that it has a very long gestation period, so the firm will have to invest for a number of years um, without seeing any result and without even seeing whether there will be a result at some point. And uh, overall, the, the, the outcome is very uncertain. So this prolonged period of investment may never see a success. Okay, so then our key question, putting these two basic facts together, is uh, how do discount rates indeed affect R&D? The basic answer that we find in the corporate finance textbook is that higher discount rate penalize future cash flow and therefore should discourage long-term investments such as investment in R&D. However, what we want to um, say in this paper uh, is that a firm's R&D decision actually largely uh, depend on uh, the competitive environment in which the firm operates, so on rival R&D decision, which in turn are also affected by these concrets. So let me give you some motivating evidence behind uh, uh, this industry equilibrium view. So this chart uh, that I'm zooming in shows you the uh, relation between uh, uh, the firm level R&D and the aggregate risk premium. And it shows you a, a positive correlation, which we wouldn't expect as I said, from the standard co corporate finance textbook intuition. And this other chart that I'm zooming now, uh, instead to show you that the number of firms by industry actually declines with the aggregate risk premium. So in this paper, we really want to take this industry equilibrium perspective and uh, try to rationalize this motivating evidence. In fact, we show that in industry equilibrium, actually higher discount rates are not necessarily detrimental to R&D. And therefore we challenge this conventional wisdom of a negative effect of higher discount rate on R&D. And uh, we show that this uh, happens through a composition effect. In fact, uh, discount rate rates affect both the composition and the nature of R&D. In particular, higher discount rate um, 
prevent entry, so have a, a negative effect on the extensive innovation margin, but then have a positive effect on the intensive innovation margin. And therefore, overall, the effect is ambiguous, so it can actually increase uh, overall at the, at the aggregate industry level. We also show that uh, uh, this contract also affects the nature of R&D uh, and therefore um, we find that actually can lead a firm to induce, uh, to, to invest in the more path-breaking type of innovation. And lastly, we acknowledge in the model that in recent years, uh, incumbents have more and more acquired uh, entrants uh, over time rather than innovating now. And uh, even when uh, accommodating this style effect that has been observed, we continue to see this uh, composition effect uh, and in addition we find an additional validation for our theory because we find that um, higher discount rates reduce the probability of entrants being acquired. Lastly, when we allow for uh, fluctuation in the uh, in discount rate, we are able to uh, rationalize key effects on R&D cyclicality. In, in particular, we are able to rationalize the Schumpeterian view that firms should invest more in uh, uh, in bad states of the economy with the documented procyclicality of R&D, and uh, we overall. Uh, um, derive some asset pricing implication. In particular, we find that lower entry um, uh, in bad state of the economy actually edges incumbents against higher discount rate. So uh, let me skip the related literature in the interest of time and let me jump into the model. So uh, we consider uh, an, economy, a, an industry uh, that features two aggregate shocks. The first is a diffusion risk. So you can think of um, um, continuous risks that uh, are not uh, discrete. And uh, uh, we consider that this diffusion risk as a market price of risk uh, denoted by eta. And then there is a jump risk that describes <coughs> uh, discrete changes in the state of the economy, uh, which is uh, reported by this second term here. So uh, we assume that there are two states of the economy, an expansion and a recession. And uh, the market price of risk and the diffusion risk is contracyclical, as uh, widely documented. And uh, uh, the, the jump risk is also priced such that risk averse uh, investors expect uh, the bad state of the economy to last um, uh, longer and the good state to be shorter. So in this setting, we consider um, heterogeneous innovation uh, to accommodate the uh, documented uh, uh, variety of innovation type. So the first type is uh, vertical or uh, the more path breaking time, the more explorative. And you should think of this as really major improvements that um, lead to a, a, a substantial improvement in the firm technology, so in the technology for which a product is manufactured. The other type is the horizontal type, so based on a given um, quality level of the technology, uh, a number of products can be created. And so this is more exploitative, uh, is horizontal, and basically creates new product within a given technological cluster, which we define as um, uh, all the products that belong uh, to a given technological quality. To put uh, ideas on labels, you can think of a vertical breakthrough as the introduction of uh, the smartphone when everyone was using a Nokia, let's say. And uh, you can think of horizontal innovation as the introduction of the iPad when everyone was already has a, there's already the technology for the iPhone. Okay, so in this setting, we consider also heterogeneity uh, among firm type. Um, so in particular, we consider a, an initiator which should be seen as the industry leader. So is the, is the latest firm that has launched a, a, a technological breakthrough and therefore um, produces a, a bunch of products that are based on this technological level and also continues to invest in innovation. Exploiters are firms that just produce. So they have a bunch of products and only produce. And entrants are a sideline of startups 
that don't have any products, but only invest in innovation. Okay, and key in the model is that breakthroughs by one, some firms obviously affect the industries um, and therefore the other firms. So let me dig more and describe more these, uh, these firms in detail. So as I said, the initiator is the latest vertical innovator that has uh, um, upgraded the technological quality in the industry. So based on this quality, uh, it um, produces a, a bunch of product lines uh, that builds on this um, technological frontier. And uh, its uh, decision is on how much to produce on each product line and how much to continue to invest in innovation. So, Q and M, so the quantity, so the quality of technology and the number of products uh, vary over time as technological breakthrough uh, unfolds. And uh, more specifically, uh, we assume that the firm can decide how much to invest in innovation. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this innovation cost is quadratic. And uh, the more the firm invests in innovation, uh, the more likely it will be uh, to attain a technological breakthrough. And upon a breakthrough uh, of the initiator, uh, quality increases by a factor lambda and uh, um, the number of product increases by a factor bar p. So the, the initiator cash flow are therefore given by the net revenues in all the product lines, net of the innovation cost. And the firm is exposed to a cash flow shock that is uh, imperfectly correlated with uh, the, 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 the aggregate shock. So key in the model is that the initiator is affected by innovation breakthrough of the, of the entrance. In particular, vertical breakthroughs uh, induce creative destruction and therefore induce the exit of the uh, initiator. Um, in particular, when uh, an entrance succeeds in a vertical dimension, uh, therefore leads to the exit of the current incumbent. And uh, this exit is costly because the initiator recovers just a fraction alpha of its value. And uh, in turn, horizontal in, uh, breakthroughs are not that dramatic, so they only lead to partial displacement. In other words, they lead to profit erosion. So the, the successful entrance creates a mass of product that partly overlap with the existing product of the initiator, and therefore this uh, leads to a reduction in the product line and the revenues of the initiator. So let me describe the entrant now that are the startups. Of the, of the industry. So the, the entrants can decide to invest either in the vertical and horizontal dimension. So the modeling of innovation is exactly as for the, for the, for the initiator in the sense that the more the entrants invest in either the vertical or the horizontal dimension, the more likely they will be to attain a, a breakthrough in either dimension. And uh, a vertical breakthrough increases the, the quality of the technology in the industry by a factor lambda, whereas an horizontal innovation creates new product. So overall entrants are making losses in expectation because they, are, they don't have product lines, they don't have revenues, they are just investing in innovation. And they are also exposed to the aggregate shock. Okay, and the entrants have to incur an entry cost to enter the industry. So lastly, let me describe the exploiters. So the exploiters are those entrants that have succeeded in the horizontal dimension. And so they, 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 they have given up on innovation and they just focus on, uh, on producing uh, in, the, in their product lines. So their cash flows are given by the, their net revenues and are also exposed to cash flow shock. And as the initiator, uh, an exploiter suffers from vertical breakthroughs. Um, uh, and in this case, vertical breakthrough either by the initiator or by the entrance, in which case the exploiter exit, or horizontal breakthroughs uh, in which they just lose some products. So we focused on an industry equilibrium in which all the firm maximize value and the mass of entrance satisfies the free entry condition. So let me define some key quantities um, before I show you the results. So in this economy, the rate of creative destruction is the rate at which entrants as a whole attain a vertical breakthrough and therefore uh, give rise to a, a new technological cluster. And this is given by how much entrants um, invest in the vertical dimension uh, 
over the mass of entrance. And similarly, the rate of uh, horizontal displacement uh, is given by how much um, entrance uh, as a whole uh, invest in the, in the horizontal dimension and times the, the mass of entrance. And let me describe this quantity, which is the rate at which new technological clusters arise, which you should think of the rate of uh, advancement of the um, of the um, technological quality of the industry, which is given by the contribution of the initiator. So whenever the initiator attain a vertical breakthrough, this is advanced, or uh, uh, the contribution of the entrance, which is the rate of creative destruction here. Okay, as you can, uh, as you have seen, uh, the, the model has many moving parts. So to, to gather intuition, uh, we start by solving the model in some corner cases in which we can uh, give the intuition through closed form solution. So consider for, uh, first the case with uh, exogenous industry dynamics. So the rate of creative destruction and the rate of horizontal displacement are exogenous. In this case, we are able to show that indeed uh, the standard intuition in corporate finance holds and therefore higher market price of risk leads to a reduction in the innovation rate uh, of the firm in the industry. Second case is the case in which um, we indeed have the industry equilibrium, but we have only vertical uh, R&D. And so in this case, uh, um, the, the rate of creative destruction is uh, endogenous and the rate of horizontal displacement is obviously zero because there's no horizontal R&D. So in this case, we're able to show analytically uh, that uh, uh, the mm, market price of risk as a positive effect on the intensive uh, innovation margin. So the innovation rate of the initiator and of the entrance um, increase with eta, but nevertheless, the uh, mass of active entrance decreases with eta. So um, the effect on the extensive margin is negative and overall uh, the rate of creative destruction goes down with the market price of risk. So this overturn already the, the, the key intuition I gave you, the conventional wisdom, and uh, it, it suggests that a higher market price of risk can act as an entry barrier and stimulate innovation by active firms. Okay, now we go to the full case with vertical and horizontal uh, innovation. So both uh, the, rate of uh, the rate of creative destruction and the rate of uh, horizontal displacement are endogenous. So in this case, we continue to see that uh, the mass of uh, active entrants decreases with the market price of risk and uh, uh, the rate of uh, innovation of the initiator and the rate of uh, vertical innovation of the entrants continues to increase in the market price of risk. So here, in addition, we have an additional uh, result that the rate of horizontal displacement is uh, hump shaped with the market price of risk. And uh, the reason is that there are offsetting uh, strengths at play. In fact, when uh, um, the market price of risk increases, uh, we see that the mass of active entrants uh, decreases, meaning that the, the incumbent firm will face lower competition um, coming from uh, uh, the entrants. And so this is a positive effect on uh, the incentive to invest in innovation. But at the same time, when the market price of risk increases, Z also increase, and this means that uh, the exploiter will face more creative destruction, more uh, like exit threat coming from the initiator, and this reduces ex ante the incentive of the entrance to become an exploiter. And so this leads to this downward sloping um, part of the curve for each. And this is already telling us that when the market price of risk is sufficiently high, uh, uh, the entrants will have more incentive to invest in the more path-breaking type of innovation rather than the more uh, exploitative type. So this is at the firm level, and this can also be seen at the aggregate level. Uh, in fact, so this chart is showing you the rate of creative destruction and the rate of horizontal displacement. And you, what you can see here is that when eta is uh, sufficiently high, 
the rate of creative destruction, so the, the rate to which vertical innovation will happen as a whole in the entrance sector uh, is higher than the rate at which horizontal innovation will, will, uh, will happen as a whole uh, uh, among the aggregates, uh, among the entrants, sorry. So the last chart here is showing you a U-shaped pattern of the arrival rate of technological clusters. Why? The reason is that, uh, as we have seen, uh, the, this quantity is the sum of the contribution of the initiator and of the entrance. And therefore, what we can see is that when the market price of risk is sufficiently low, in fact, the negative effect on the extensive margin dominates. However, when the market price of risk is sufficiently high, the mass of active entrance is, is already low, and so actually the increase in the intensive innovation margin actually can dominate. Okay, so in an extension, we allow for, uh, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the incumbent to acquire entrance. And so to do this, we allow the initiator to search for targets with an endogenous intensity. Uh, so this is really a search for uh, good firms, and for good startups. And uh, therefore, the, the, the acquisition probability is obviously a function of the, of the search intensity, so it increases with us. So, and what we can find in this uh, extension is that the mass of active entrants continue to de be decreasing in the market price of risk, and the intensive margin continue to be increasing with eta. And in addition, what we find is that the acquisition probability uh, decreases with the market price of risk, which is indeed uh, uh, consistent with the evidence in a double addition plosser that acquisition are more likely with lower discount rates. So in the last step of the model, uh, we consider time varying market price of risk. And uh, again, to gather the intuition behind the result, we start with the case in which there's only vertical innovation. So what we find here is that, again, at the, at the firm level, so the intensive innovation margin is, is, uh, is become countercyclical. So it's higher in bad state of the economy. But at the same time, the mass of active entrants is procyclical. And actually, we, what we find is that the, uh, the, the, the extensive innovation margin is more sensitive to variation in the, in the market price of risk than the intensive margin. So overall, our model uh, is capable of reconciling the Schumpeterian view of uh, uh, countercyclical firm level innovation, so that firms should be more willing to invest more in bad state of the economy with the largely documented procyclicality of, uh, of aggregate innovation. And the reason is that there are pro and countercyclical strengths that coexist. In fact, the mass of active entrance is procyclical, and so the, the aggregate contribution of the entrance is higher in good state of the economy. However, at the firm level, investment of uh, active firm is countercyclical, which is true for both the startups that are able to remain active in the, in the bad state of the economy and the incumbent. And this is a, um, an interesting result because it's consistent with uh, a recent paper by Tania Babina, Bernstein and Mezzanotti uh, that the procyclicality of observed innovation actually has a deep heterogeneity behind and uh, there are several strengths uh, at play. So it, innovation doesn't uh, decrease for all the firms in the industry. Okay. Um, so in a, an extension of the model, we allow for uh, uh, shifts in the supply of finance, because of course you can mention, yes, but in, a, in bad state of the economy, another strength that happen is that uh, financing become very, very costly for the, for the entrants, and uh, arguably more for the entrants than for the incumbents. And so to, uh, we, we allow for this uh, into, into the model as a, as a robustness, and what we, what we do is uh, we allow the entry cost to include a financial component that, in fact, increases in the, in the bad state of the economy. And so all our baseline results are uh, confirmed and, uh, and uh, are actually quantitatively stronger, so the, the extensive margin effect becomes even um, uh, more uh, procyclical in this case. 
So lastly, we conclude with some asset pricing implication uh, and uh, asset price uh, risk premium in our model uh, uh, compensate for both the diffusion and the jump risk in the economy. And uh, we basically find uh, uh, three main findings. Uh, first of all, competition in innovation makes incumbent riskier. So whatever is uh, um, a quantity that makes your competitors more uh, innovation intensive actually leads to an increase in the in the risk premium of the incumbents. However, the, the, the risk premium of the incumbent can reduce if the, the firm manage, manages to invest more in innovation. And lastly, what we find is that the extensive innovation margin uh, can edge the incumbents uh, otherwise uh, against the otherwise negative effect of increases in the in the risk premium in the in the bad state of the economy. So let me let me just conclude, given that I'm running out of time. So in this paper, we, we challenge the conventional wisdom that discount rate have a negative effect of innovation. And uh, the key message is that to really gauge uh, the impact, uh, one has to take into account the, the, the industry uh, aspect because uh, firms don't operate in a vacuum but are largely affected by what happens and what are the other the decision of other firms. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. The discussion is Nicola Serrano Velarde from Bocco University. You have 15 minutes. Perfect. Can you actually hear me well if I'm not standing behind the pulpit? Perfect. OK. Um, first of all, let me thank the uh, conference organizers for putting together this absolutely amazing program. It's an absolute pleasure to be invited to discuss uh, Francesca and Cecilia's paper entitled Innovation, Industry Equilibrium and Discount Rates. Now, what Cecilia and Francesca are after is one of the most fundamental and tricky questions in, in economics. It's what should be the delicate balance between competition and innovation, between rents and incentives. And this is really one of the transversal questions in economics because you can think about infrastructure investment, patent protection, or drug pricing. This trade-off is everywhere. In fact, one of the latest examples is in the US with the Biden um, Inflation Reduction Act, which has an impact on the way that pharmaceutical companies can basically price their drugs. And the pharmaceutical sector was basically kind of making it very clear that these new pricing rules would negatively affect their incentives to innovate. Okay? So a fundamental question. A fundamental question which has also received a fresh new perspective in the last couple of years. I'm not going to absolutely make any justice to all of the great papers that have been coming out. I'm just going to kind of focus on two of them here. One of them is uh, by Ufuk Akshigit and Sina Ates in the Journal of Political Economy. And what they document in the US economy is that over the last 30 to 40 years, there has been a worrying kind of decrease in small business dynamism. Okay? And what they document both empirically and theoretically is that actually what happens is that there is a widening between market leaders and followers, the best versus the rest. They examine different factors that could kind of explain this kind of secular decline. And they conclude that uh, a declining knowledge diffusion within the American economy is a very uh, you know, potent source of this. Similarly, we have Liu Mian and Sufi, which in the Econometrica paper in 2022, look at the similar pattern of kind of decrease in uh, competition and uh, slowing productivity growth and argue that one of the important trends to understand at the same time is a secular decline in interest rates. Very simple intuition. It's that the secular decline in interest rate will have a disproportionate effect on market leaders, which will basically exacerbate and kind of worsen competition. Okay? So again, this is interesting to understand where uh, Cecilia and Francesca's paper is going to kind of place itself. And one, is, one of the interesting aspects is that these papers have really looked at long-term trends. And what Cecilia and uh, Francesca are proposing is to say, hey, we actually also need to think about uh, 
the market risk premium. Okay? The market risk premium is, you know, for all corporate finance classes, like one of the most important quantities because it is the common component of a firm's discount factor. And Corporate Finance 101 tells you, you know, you do your NPV calculation, and the higher is the discount factor, the lower are your incentives to invest. Now, what is interesting is that they kind of reproduce and argue, yes, there is a direct effect of this discount factor, which kind of worsens uh, R&D investment, but you should not stop there. You need to go from this very narrow view to a more kind of macro view to some extent, in which you take into account the effect of this increase in the discount factor on entry rates into the economy. Okay? So the idea is that this market risk premium discourages entry, and by doing this, you basically lower the propensity of market stealing. What does it mean? It means that as an incumbent that invests into R&D, you're going to kind of be happy because your R&D investment is less likely to depreciate. It's less likely to disappear because someone just kind of innovated on top of you. Okay? Now, the key question that I find is fascinating to kind of go after here is why in their setting the indirect effect coming from the competition channel dominates the direct effect. And that is going to kind of structure my discussion. So, I will not repeat what Francesca fantastically outlined. I would just like to underline this is an amazingly impressive exercise. You have a continuous time industry equilibrium, two sources of aggregate risk, two types of innovation, three types of firms. Okay, so you, you get the picture. Um, my discussion is going to really uh, try to um, be in three points. So first of, the, first of, uh, the first point is really, you know, trying to understand what motivated uh, Cecilia and Francesca to look at innovation and entry from this particular angle and try to understand whether, you know, there are not other angles and other perspectives which might be interesting to include. The second uh, point will be to understand a little bit what is the kind of simplistic model structure and which are the ingredients that really drive this domination of the indirect effect with respect to the direct effect of discount factors. And then, if time permits, and Simone is very generous with me, then uh, we can also discuss what are the policy implications that we want to draw from this. Okay? So, on the data side, one of the fantastic things is that the motivation is uh, very straightforward and you can kind of convince yourselves immediately of this. You just download from Eric's web page the market risk premia, you look at the CompuStart R&D to assets expenditures, and you line them up uh, on the Y and the X axis, and you find this positive correlation. Okay? Easy peasy. Second aspect is you do exactly the same. You go to, uh, I think it was the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics, and you kind of take the number of firms by industry, you line them up against the market risk premium, negative correlation. Okay? So, I do understand why they kind of took this entry point into their paper. At the same time, I, kind of, I was kind of wondering about how the time variation looks like for each of these single elements. So, when you look at the market risk premium, you have the usual kind of cyclical variation that we would expect from it. Okay? So, that works out. At the same time, when you look at entry rates into the economy, the relationship becomes significantly harder to kind of reconcile with the cyclicality. Why? Because it's just a big time trend, a big decline from 14% to less than 10% between the 1980s and the 2010s. Okay, line this up with the R&D spending. Again, you just take the CompuSat, line them up on the, on the time scale, and what you see is indeed an increase in R&D spending, but it's really just a secular uh, kind of time trend here that they are spending more. Now, obviously on the face value, lower entry, higher R&D is perfectly consistent with the uh, st uh, storyline of uh, Francesca and Cecilia, but the variation kind of is a little bit at odds. Okay? The other aspect that is a little bit at odds is that when you actually look at not the number of firms in an industry, but rather the net ent entry into industries, the relationship becomes a bit flatter, to be honest. Okay? So, this was just to kind of like try to understand where the different contributions come from in an empirical way. Now, in terms of the modeling, as I said, absolutely impressive. I needed to really simplify my mind in terms of what's going on. So, 
Here is a very simplified representation of the model and who does what. So you need to think about like an industry or a cluster in which there is an initiator. This initiator has a certain number of product lines, in this example three, and that are characterized by a quality level, QT. Okay, so it's a quality ladder model. When the initiator innovates, okay, he has a homogeneous R&D innovation, he not only increases every uh, product line by a uh, step size small lambda, but also is able to gain additional product lines. Okay, so there is like two things that happen, very potent. And here comes basically the difference and a little bit the difficulty in kind of following every step of the model. It is that none of these players actually have the same kind of R&D cost benefits, right? Because when you look at the entrant, the entrant, first of all, needs to decide between do I do a horizontal or vertical innovation? And both of them have different costs and both of them have different returns. Why? Because you do horizontal innovation, meaning the boring innovation. The only thing that you will get is that you will steal basically product lines from the initiator. It's very wasteful because you basically just, you're, you're not even uh, improving them, okay? However, when you get a vertical breakthrough, what happens is that you get all the free product lines of the initiator and you improve it by a step size, which is big lambda, okay? So this is kind of the simplified representation, but one of the things that you get is that it is really a little bit tricky to follow because there are many kind of uh, the small asymmetries and you're kind of uh, wondering, might the reason for the kind of greater intensive margin reaction of incumbents to the discount factors be related simply to the way that, we've, um, that the catch-up mechanism is uh, present in the model. So the catch-up mechanism in these type of models is always extremely important. So you have this automatic diffusion of technology to followers, whether it's in the Liu model or in the actual Git model. And in fact, a recent contribution by Lopez Salido and co-authors of the Fed shows that this is really kind of, has the ability to overturn uh, results. So is, the, is this kind of why we obtain like this, this indirect effect is, is really bigger than the direct effect? Then you have the question of the strategic interactions, okay? So the exploiters uh, here, so one of the things is that entrants can innovate, but they face an entry cost. And they need to decide between two types of R&D. On the other hand, the guys that actually don't need to uh, invest anymore into entry costs are not allowed to innovate. These are the exploiters, they just produce. So, one of the questions is whether, you know, the way that we set it up in terms of the follower being really the entrance doesn't really kind of, again, make this entry channel more potent, this indirect effect more potent than the direct uh, discount factor effect, okay? And then the, the other kind of point from a, a theoretical perspective is really that here when uh, the, so the, the result that at the intensive margin, the R&D investment of firms are counter cyclical, whether this is not really due to the fact of how we think about financial constraints. So these R&D intensive firms are documented to have much more intangible assets. The intangible assets are related to the high likelihood of financial constraints. Could this overturn the results? Well, yes. Aguillon in 2012 kind of on French data and uh, a stylized model shows that if you introduce, if you go from a frictionless economy to one with financial constraints, then you go from counter-cyclical to pro-cyclical intensive margin investment, okay? A similar kind of question is about, okay, how do we think about uncertainty in these R&D firms? So a colleague of mine, Max Koche, uh, together with Ravi Bansal and co-authors, have a document that these firms, these R&D intensive firms, are more exposed to uncertainty and because of this will cut investment due to uh, volatility shocks, okay? So then, oh, I'm doing pretty good, very good. In terms of policy, I, I'm kind of like wondering what uh, Cecilia and Francesca, uh, where they want to take the paper. Because at the moment, in the current version that I was reading, they were very kind of uh, hands off on this. And the reason is it's, it's a little bit tricky to interpret, right? Because you could basically say that this is a model that uh, tells you, this is the Schumpeterian view, you know, financial crisis, something happens, hands off, okay? You know, so, of course, it depends on where you are on the support of the market risk premium, 
Okay, but it could be one of the lessons from this paper. But again, is this something that we want to push or not? Also, in terms of uh, innovation policies, what does this paper tell us? Do, uh, does this paper tell us something about the way that we want to kind of differentially subsidize uh, R&D as opposed to entry? And in the case that we decide to subsidize R&D, one of the extreme challenges is to address the heterogeneity, because here in this model, horizontal R&D is totally wasteful. Okay, so I would like to kind of like pick their minds on uh, how they want to, kind of, uh, to, to basically embed their framework for policymakers. In conclusion, this is a really thought-provoking paper and a must-read, an important question, uh, technically extremely impressive, and uh, I would kind of encourage them to develop better like the intuition uh, about the relative strength of the direct and the indirect effects how they are linked to specific elements of the modeling and how they can inform our policy making. So thank you so much, this was a fantastic read. Thank you, thank you, Nicolas. Francesca, do you want to quickly react before opening the floor yeah, for thanks. discussion? Thanks a lot for uh, your very thoughtful discussion. Uh, this is very, this is great. Um, so, um, so you're right that, um, I mean, our evidence is, uh, is just motivating, so it's not a proper full-fledged uh, empirical investigation. And we are aware of all these papers that try to explain these uh, several trends, like these secular trends uh, over the, the past several decades. Uh, so we, we um, let's say, we, we acknowledge that uh, on, a, on a, an empirical level, there are um, several trends that have driven like this um, this uh, increase in R and D and the uh, decline in the number of firms. Um, but um, uh, let's say we don't try to explain like this trend as the, the Liu, Mian, and Sufi paper, for instance. Uh, although it it would be interesting, so we, we discussed this uh, in the in the past. But we thought you know, maybe it's just for a for a for a subsequent paper. In terms of the mechanism, um, so. Um, Actually, in the original version of the paper uh, that we, like the very first version, uh, the, the initiator were both investing in, so were separately investing in the vertical and the horizontal dimension, um, exactly as the entrants were doing. And um, the feeling was, uh, even from comments we were getting, were that there were too many innovations, and so we should simplify and we should take advantage of the idea that um, incumbents are actually very knowledgeable already of the industry, and so whenever they can do a vertical innovation, they already have in mind how they can apply this, like, um, uh, this technology as to produce different products and hence the, uh, the, the way we, we, we frame the version you read. So in that sense, um, like even if we allow for this aspect, the, the results are still there actually. So um, it doesn't tamper. So um, one thing, so given that you raised uh, Liumin and Sufi, so I'd say the, the main difference uh, compared to Liumin and Sufi is that they indeed uh, take this um, this model from the Agion literature in which there's just a duopoly of firms and so the, the two firms can just be either um, like at the same level or a leader and follower so they don't allow for, for fresh entry which we, we think it's, it's a main um, difference that um, should be taken into account. Um, the role of financial constraints, uh, yes, so as I, as I showed, like financial constraints have a disproportionately stronger effect of entrance vis-a-vis -vis incumbents. So the way we thought about including financial constraints is really just to put them on the entrance side and normalize them to zero for, uh, for the incumbents. But of course, uh, you could do them, put financial constraints for, uh, for, uh, for the incumbents as well. But like the, the, the important aspect would be that like it's the the gap between the two that matters and so still the, the incumbents would have an advantage because they have pledgeable income as opposed to the entrance that they do not. 
uh, policy, yes, uh, we don't take a stand on this. Uh, you're right uh, about the U-shaped pattern that like puts, uh, like it, it implies that a, a one size fits all uh, approach wouldn't work because in fact, <coughs> like at the aggregate level, you have this, uh, this U-shape. I mean, I guess one uh, perspective you could take is uh, how um, monetary policy uh, can affect discount rates. Um, uh, the reason why we don't take this approach is that in the data, the volatility of the aggregate risk premium is order of magnitude higher than the, the risk-free rate. And so um, that's why we, we think more about the the, the market price of risk as opposed to the interest rate. But yes, I mean, it's definitely food for thought and we will definitely think out a little about this. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Question from the floor. If you, if you can okay, state your name and your yeah. affiliation for everybody Christian else. Kubica, ECB. Um, hi, Francesca, great presentation. Um, I, I have one question that relates to the, to the very last comment also you made on the relation between monetary policy, discount rates, and ETA in your model, the, the risk premium. How I understand uh, your model is that variation in the discount rate, the risk premium, is also very tightly linked to variation in volatility overall. Um, so when the risk premium increases, it also means that volatility increases. And so I'm just wondering um, whether the effect that you're observing, the comparative statics with respect to the risk premium, are driven by the fact that the discount rate changes or by the fact that volatility changes. Um, because uh, I guess there's many non-linearities in the model, so we would expect that firms also react to changes in, in, in volatility. And so the question is, is really what, what is the channel here, and would even if you have an exogenous change in discount rate, for example, due to uh, a change in the risk-free rate opposed to a change in the volatility, would that have similar effects, or would we expect different effects? Um, because here an important channel is that the risk premium is linked to volatility. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. So actually we take two separate uh, parameters. So one is for volatility and one is for the market price of risk. So we make an exercise in which the, uh, the, the risk premium is endogenous, but in the baseline actually to, to have things clean and, uh, and clear, <laughs> we, we take it as exogenous. And so the, the volatility is one thing and the market price of risk is separate. So, uh, um, but uh, overall, uh, so <coughs> further on uh, the effect of uh, risk-free rate as opposed to uh, the, the aggregate risk premium uh, would be, uh, apart from what I already said, that the volatility of the market um, of the aggregate risk premium is much higher, is that the countercyclicality of the risk-free rate as opposed to the uh, risk premium uh, is the opposite. So um, if we just focus on the risk-free rate, uh, actually the, the results of the cyclicality would flip and would be counterfactual actually. So that's why, um, I mean, in the aggregate you should see that in fact the cyclicality of the, of the um, uh, risk premium dominates anyway, so yeah. Other points? Um, yes, look. Yeah, thanks, Francesca. Also, a great discussion. Um, look, I have an ECB. So, um, what are the implications of in your model for firm size distribution? Does it also move with the discount rate? It wasn't clear because they, I guess all these innovators start with the same mass, but I couldn't. Yes. So yeah, so it's it's a um, it's something that we we don't investigate actually in the paper. Um, but like uh, you should see that um, firms actually become bigger uh, when the market price of risk increases because of these like um, effects that is driven by uh, the lower competition and the greater incentive to invest in innovation. And uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, you should see that um, the, the competition, in fact, decreases. But um, <coughs> it's a point that we want to, 
probably um, develop further that is not currently, but it's, a, it's an interesting point. Sorry, I uh, left out the second part, because uh, the reason I'm asking, this sounds a little bit like coming at it from a completely different angle, is that there's been a huge shift since Lucas wrote about firm size distributions in the US. We're trying to understand where it's coming from, and yeah. there is this wave of papers you refer to, like the leaders, yes, the laggards, yes. and all that. And so I think it would be really interesting, especially for the innovators, to see what happens to the distribution of the firm size, if it's... No, somewhat you, consistent with what you see in the data, yes, because you may that, have an interesting story there. Yes, but that would go again like in the direction of like explaining the secular trends. Uh, that the problem is that relying on the market risk premium to explain the secular trend, as is, as uh, as Nicholas um, showed you very convincingly, it it goes, it varies a lot over time. So, I guess our story is on top of the secular trends that happen for whatever reason, so this moving uh, distribution, like there's this additional, like, if you like, um, effect of the market risk premium that moves uh, these at, uh, things at higher frequency, uh, uh, if you like. Thank you, Francesca and Nicolas. And let me invite the next speakers on the podium. The next paper is by Marianna Kudliak from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and she's going to talk about churn and stability. In 25 minutes. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's an excellent program and thank you to the organizers for putting our paper on the program. It's a joint work with Bob Hall and since I work at the Fed, the usual disclaimer applies. The views expressed here are our own. So the key questions that we are after is what is the individual path from non-employment to a stable job? And more generally, how can we rationalize the observed transitions among labor market activities in the data. Specifically, what do we see in the data in terms of transitions between unemployment, non-participation or OLF, and employment? So there are three key observations that we are focusing on. First, paths to stable jobs differ. So there is heterogeneity. Second, past labor market activities matter. That is, transitions among labor market activities are known first order Markov. And third, we observe that some people frequently switch between short-term job, non-participation, unemployment. And often it is interpreted as misclassification error, but it could be a change in personal circumstances. So what we do in this research, we want to develop a modeling strategy and a set of empirical results to rationalize these transitions that we see in the data and focus both on turnover dimension and heterogeneity dimension. And we want to pay particular attention to this non-Markov non nature of the path of activities in the data. So just very basic, uh, when we approach this problem, what we are thinking, we are thinking the following. For some people, the, the flow value of non-market activity, meaning being outside of the labor market, is so low as compared to the value in labor market, in labor market so that they work continuously. For other people, those values are close to each other, so they switch between work and non-work. And yet, for another group, the value out of labor market is so much higher that they take jobs seldom or never at all. Okay? So, our approach is bridging two literatures, the transition dynamics as in Blanchard and Diamond, and search and matching Mortis and Pissarides model. And the basic modeling principle is the personal dynamic problem. Just to give you an idea of what we find, we find that the data, the data can be described as a mixture of five individual types in terms of labor market dynamics. And there will be two types that I 
stably in one activity, and there will be three types that are mover types. That is, they are in different activities at different times. So very briefly, those two stable types, we call them one type all N, where N stands for out of labor force. So they are mostly out of the labor force. Another type, all E, those are mostly employed. And the rest are those three mover types that typically constitute one third of the population. Among those mover types, there is one type, we call them high E, high employment type. These guys, they are mostly employed 90% of the time. 90% of their ergodic distribution is in employment. If they find themselves out, themselves out of jobs, they find work very quickly, they take short-term jobs that lead to stable employment. And then there are the other two mover types, one called high unemployment, that spends 37% in unemployment, and another called high OLF, 60% in OLF. So these people, they typically switch among labor market activities, and when they lose jobs, they have a hard time to get back. And so just very quickly, how we see our contribution. So we show that one can explain the observed transition in the data, as a mixture of individual types. The second is that we find that unemployment is heavily concentrated in the segment of a labor market. Third, this frequent switching among labor market activity typically signals low employment type. And finally, we, can, we say that we can rationalize these observed labor market dynamics in terms of structural model of labor choice. So very quickly about the data. The data that we use is a current population survey so we probably all know what it is. So what exactly from that data use? We will be using individual panels. So in the data, you have four months on, on an individual, then eight months they are not interviewed, and then another four months. So basically, you have 16 months of the data, but essentially eight months with a gap in between. So the specific data that we will be using is the activity as recorded by the CPS, employment, out of labor force, meaning no job and no search, and unemployment. And we will denote them E and U. So in each month, there are three activities, eight months, three to the power eight possible paths. So we construct that distribution and we focus on something what we call normal times, 2013, 2017, okay? We do this uh, separately for women, for women, 25, 54 year old, and separately for men. And later, um, in the, not in this presentation, we also focus by education and so on. And so essentially, this is how our data moments look like. We have 6,561 paths, and each has a probability attached. And my data slide is this one just to give you an idea how it looks. So this pass EEE -E -E with some gap, this one among, uh, in our men sample, there are 77% that has this pass. The second most numerous pass is this NNN, 7%. And 16 are all these other pass. So what we will be doing with our model, we will be matching this 77, 7, and all these that sitting in 16 individually. Outline of the approach. So, we will first construct uh, an economic model, a system Bellman equations for a single type. So that type, as I will be hidden Markov process that I will explain in a moment, and there will be shocks hitting the individual and individual will be choosing which state, which activity to choose to go to. As there is, when we solve the individual problem, we will have a transition matrix that will be Markov in hidden states and that will allow, there will be crosswalk from state, from hidden state to observe activity. And for that type, we can generate the equivalent of what we see in the data, 16 months activity pass. Our full model, it's a mixture of types. So the full model equivalent of what we see in the data is just this sum, M tilde, omega theta, it's a probability of that type, the share of the type, mixing probability, and each type will have this pass as a function of type-specific program parameters. And so our goal now is to find this beta, beta with the coefficient theta, the program parameters for the type, to find the weight for each type, 
and also to determine the number of types, capital theta, in the population. So how we do it? Basically, we, involve, we do methods, um, matching moments exercise. In our case, it will be maximum likelihood. Okay? Just a few words about the, uh, the, program, uh, the dynamic program for each type. So the, the dynamic program for the type is very simple because we want to focus on the statistical properties of our, paper, of, of the, of our approach. So basically, an individual has a linear utility in consumption, maximizes that utility, no savings. There are four hidden activities, four, sorry, four hidden states, uh, employment, and the employment will have hidden states, short-term job and long-term job. And then there will be a non-work state and something called activated non-work. So there are four hidden states and each state gives rise to activity. If you're in a certain state, you can choose. For example, if you're in non-work state, you can choose OLF for unemployment. But if you are in short-term job or long-term job, the observed activity is only employment. Um, just very quickly, in what sense it's hidden? At the end of the day in equilibrium, non-work states will correspond one-to-one -to, -one to activity. But employment hidden state, short-term, long-term job, will correspond to observed one activity. In that sense, it will be hidden. Econometrician will not know what state the individual is in. So an individual is, so the story in the model goes like this. An individual is in a state and a specific activity. Individual receives the flow value specific to that state. And then individual is hit by opportunity or shock to transition to a new state and choose another activity. And that is all depending where on the state and activity he is now in. And so uh, the individual chooses which state to go to and what activity to undertake based on comparing Bellman value from all these possibilities. I'm skipping the structure, but basically this is, uh, this is the main idea. And so what's happening in the model, the transitions among states is an individual choice. The transitions are driven by random arrival of opportunities and shocks. And so if you solve this model, we can get a transition matrix. It's a Markov transition matrix among those four states. And using Bellman values, you can also get the, which activity is chosen in each state. Okay? So this is the, the task in this model. Um, how to come up with, how to solve for this transition matrix? There is like uh, some difficulty because the transitions are determined by the ranking of Bellman values. So Bellman values, um, in this case, is the function of transition probabilities and flow values. Multiple, multiple sets of flow values can support the same ranking. So in this model, the flow values will not be point identified, but only set identified. Basically, if somebody transitions from, an, from one activity to another, there's a full set of flow values that can support that. In our data, when we are using only transitions, we cannot point identify, but we will have something to say about it later. Okay, statistical model, I already briefly mentioned. We have the model counterpart. We have this transition matrix from the model. We generated the path, the function of types parameters, then constructed this M tilde as a function of beta. Beta is a vector of all types dynamic programming parameters. Omega is a vector of types, different types weights. And capital theta is a number of types in the population. And so we write down the maximum likelihood and we are estimating, given capital theta, we are estimating all these parameters using the data that I described before. So how we in practice estimate it, we say, okay, let's first send, so essentially what we are doing, let's say, uh, we are saying, let's start with capital theta being three types and we can repeat it until capital theta is 10. And then we use information criterion to choose how many types data would like. So essentially what we are doing, let's say with three types, we are sending three four by four transition matrices to the data, each with a weight and we are, asking the data to, to give us the answer what is those parameters. So at the end of the day, uh, we find that the five is a good number of types, but we will be doing one trick. Basically, when we send five types to the data, we will be sending two types with degenerate matrices to help the data match this distribution that has such a heavy weight on EEE. 
We will send one degenerate matrix where the type is always stably employed, another degenerate matrix where the type is always OLF, and the other three matrices will be free. Okay? So the result. I will focus results on like three key, three key conclusions. So first of all, uh, we find that heterogeneity is identified and is substantial. What does it mean that heterogeneity is substantial? Well, we find different transition matrices in statistical sense and in quantitative sense, and also we find non-zero weight on each matrix. Okay? So to explain what we find, um, in this figure I have the ergodic distribution over states and activities, meaning for each type we estimated matrices and we can calculate ergodic distribution. So in the, in the first column you see there it says activity and UE, that is observed. In the second column you see the state that is not observed but it's in the model. On the very last column it says data and the numbers are 10.6, 3.2, 86.2. That's from the data. Second to last column has a full model. Basically, our model matches data very well. Not only on these numbers, but in the paper we do lots of, um, basically from the model we say, oh, what is the path from unemployment to employment over 16 months and so on. We do this very well because our model has two tools to match the non-Markov structure in the data. The first tool, each type already have non-Markov paths of activities. Underlying hidden state is Markov, but the path is non-Markov. So each type has already non-Markov path of activities. On top of it, we have a mixture of types. So we are doing well, very well in terms of matching aggregate data. Now, what do we learn from the model? So there are five types. Let's look at this. It's called all n type one. By construction, the matrix is degenerate, so they are spending all their time in out of labor force. What, we, what is not by construction, how many of those are in the population? And this, this table is for, for uh, prime working age men specifically. So there are 6% of those in the population. Now, on the other hand, there's all E type, type 5. By construction, they are always employed in long term job. And we find there are 66% 66 of those. In, the, in my data slide, I showed you that there, there are 77 histories that, has e, that have EEE and EEE. So 66% are in this type. The remaining 77 minus 66 are sitting in the middle, okay? So in the middle there are three types for which we sent those four by four matrices and estimated them. And so the matrices came back from MATLAB and we looked at them and those types, they brought their own names, okay? So there was one type that was heavily concentrated on OLF. We call them high N, it's a column two. Basically, 51% of the ergodic distribution was in OLF. There was some employment, some unemployment, but mostly OLF. So there are 7% of those in the population at the bottom, in the bottom line. Second type was high unemployment type. These guys, 30, 34% of their time, they're in unemployment. They're sometimes employed, sometimes OLF, but heavily in unemployment. There are 5% in the population of, of, of types like this. And finally, there was a high employment type. These guys combined short-term, long-term employment, 90%. But they also sometimes unemployed, sometimes OLF. There are 15% of those. So this is how we characterize the data. And so just very briefly about job finding and job losing of those three types in the middle. When any of these types finds long-term employment, the separation from long-term employment is very similar among each type, like approximately 5%. So once they find stable job, they are in it. But the problem is the differences in finding a job depending on whether you are high N, high U, high E. So high employment type has a high probability to find stable job. It's approximately 60-80%. The other types, probability to find the job, a stable job, is like 10-15%. So that's the difference, and I will circle back to it in a moment. So first result, heterogeneity is substantial. Second, following from the first, unemployment is heavily concentrated in a specific segment of the population. Just to here for prime working age men, blue bars is the share of each type in the population. Red bars, how much unemployment comes from each segment. So the segment high U, 5% of the population, 60% of unemployment. 
Okay. Just one more thing that I want to, uh, to going back to the previous result. We did the same for prime work uh, for um, we sample of women. We did the same for a sample of, let's say, women, and then you have education. The transition matrices are rather similar, and these types are similar, whether you are looking men, women, education, let's say highly educated, college plus, or lower educated, what will differ the share of each type in the population? So even with people with higher education, you will find types that OLF always, E always, and so on, okay? So in that sense, heterogeneity is rather unobserved, at least what we observe is that we look. And so that's the second result, and third result, Third result is the circling among unemployment, out of labor force, and short-term jobs. It's, it signals low employment type. So here we plot the probability of a type engaged in this activity month to month. So high employment type, very, very low probability. The other types are much more likely to engage in circling. Okay, so now, so now kind of going back to this economics of types. And so um, we estimated the transition probabilities. And now we want to learn something about flow values or Bellman values associated with work, non-work, and so on. So as I mentioned, because the transitions are kind of are the transitions take place when there is a certain ranking of Bellman values. And so flow values are not point identified. So we characterize the set of flow values that support the transition matrix. And then what we did, we developed this notion, what we call typical flow value. And then based on this typical flow value, we can construct Bellman values for the type from working long-term job, job, working short-term job, and so on. And this is what we learned. When we look at the flow values from stable job versus non-work for high employment types. For this type, the flow value from work is much higher than flow value from non-work. When we look at the flow value from work and non-work of those low employment type, for them the, probability, the flow values are rather close. As I already mentioned before, the probabilities to find a stable job differ. And so what it will translate to that Bellman value or value from stable job for high employment type will be rather close to the value of non-work for that type. Basically, even if they lose the job, it's very easy to get back. But for the, for the low employment types, even though their flow values are close to each other, because the probability to get stuck out of job is so high that the flow value from work is much higher than flow value from non-work. And I have the figure of those Bellman values. So again, we are only talking here about those mover types because for them it makes sense to look at different activities that they move, uh, move uh, among. So there are three panels, each represent different type. And Basically, these bars, it's Bellman values from different states and activities in the model, and they are demeaned. So let's look at the panel to the right. It says high employment type. This green bar, it's a Bellman value demeaned for this type for work in long-term job. All these other bars are value from working from unemployment, from short-term job, and there is some off-equilibrium activity going on that I didn't want to... I don't want to take more, um, we can read about this in the paper. But basically, for, low, for high employment type, the green bar is rather close to the, so green bar is positive for each, for each group. So value from work and stable job is much bet, is better than value from all these other activities. But for high employment type, the green bar is rather close to those other bars. For high unemployment type or for high OLF type, the value from work, the green bar, is much better than value from non-work. And so in that sense, the life of these guys, high N or high U, is much riskier as compared to, to this high employment type. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we, uh, our model makes sense of 16 months of spans of labor market activity observed in the CPS. 
we find that heterogeneity is substantial. Unemployment is heavily concentrated in a specific se segment of the population. Frequent circling signals low employment types. And we find that high employment types have much higher flow value from work than non-work as compared to low employment type. But their values from work and non-work are much closer together than for low employment types. Thank you. Thank you, Marianna. The discussion is Jane Olsen Ramsey from the London School of Economics. Okay, thank you very much for having me to discuss this um, very interesting work by Marianna and Bob. Um, so I see the first contribution of this project as really being to write down a very parsimonious model. And this, the fact that this model is very parsimonious means that it's, it makes the estimation easy and clear. That's going to allow us to estimate or infer the existence of different worker types in the US economy with employment transitions that are much richer than what you could get by writing down a single representative agent model with Markov transitions between these states. So in particular, they want to match things like duration, dependence of unemployment, and so on. And they're able to do that in a very clean way. So that's one contribution. The second contribution is just the very interesting findings, many of which um, Mariana already showed. I'm just going to focus on three of these because they're kind of related to the, to the comments that I'm going to give. So the first of these is they find that five types seem to fit the data well. There's a type that's always working. These are the EE types. There's a type that never works. These are the NN types. And then there's about a third of the population that moves around a lot between um, different labor market activities. And these can be characterized by the states in which they spend the most time. So there's some of these movers that spend the most time in employment, some that spend the most time in unemployment, and some that spend the most time not working. Um, the second interesting result is they do all of this estimation separately for men and women, but what that reveals is that the transition probabilities that the different types face are actually pretty similar whether it's men or women. So it's not that um, conditional on type men and women look very different in terms of their probability of finding a job, but it's just that um, men have a higher share of always working and women have a higher share of mover types. So if we were to think about the contribution of churn by gender, we would find that women contribute more to overall labor market churn. Um, but not because of different transition probabilities conditional on type, but instead that, that there seem to be more of the, of the mover types among women. The third and I think most provocative result of this paper is that a very small fraction of the population, whether it's men or women, contribute to unemployment spells. So the finding in particular is that 5% of men are responsible for 60% of all unemployment among men. Um, and this is, this is going to be, have, I think, very interesting policy implications, potentially. Um, and this is, again, similar uh, when we look at women. So my comments are going to be, first, what are the, you know, taking as given, I think they very convincingly argue that these different types exist. What can we learn from this in terms of first policy implications? And second, can we use observed heterogeneity to understand better these worker types? Or is it going to be more unobserved heterogeneity? I think that's an interesting issue as well. OK, but before I give my comments, let me just review the structure of the model and how the estimation works. So there's going to be these hidden four states that agents know, but the econometrician does not. State one is being non-activated and not having a job offer. State two is being activated but not holding a job offer. State three is having a short-term job offer. And state four is having a long-term job offer. Then agents can um, translate these individual states that they know into a choice of a labor market activity, these three different activities that we see in the data. And I think this is illustrated well, and I'm, I'm kind of happy that I included this because this wasn't um, in Mariana's presentation, to actually spell out what do the Bellman uh, equations look like. So this is the Bellman equation for someone who is in state one, they're not activated. And uh, this is their value of uh, choosing to not be in the labor force. So the choice for this agent is going to be just between not being in the labor force or choosing unemployment. And that choice is going to imply different probabilities of transitioning to the other states next period. So this value is going to depend on the flow value of being in the state Z. 
um, and different um, states are going to result in different flow values. So B is the value of being unemployed, W3 is the, val the wage in a short-term job, and W4 is the value in a long-term, the flow value in a long-term job. And then they discount the future at some rate, 1 over 1 plus R, that's fine. And then when they think about the future, they take into account the transition probabilities that they face, and these are going to be some of the objects that the estimation delivers, these different tau's, the transition rates that they face. When they arrive in a potentially new state next period, they'll again have a choice over these different Bellman values, and they'll choose the max, obviously, to maximize their utility. So you notice that um, when you're in state four and you hold a long-term job, uh, job offer, you can choose any of the, the lower, um, st lower states. The estimation is going to rely on the fact that um, you can partition these Bellman equations into different rankings, and only rankings where um, for example, a long-term job, uh, working in a long-term job is ranked above not working, would you observe someone transition from not working to then taking a long-term job? This is all kind of addressing the problem that as an econometrician, we don't know the opportunity set of these people. And so these movers are all going to fall into the partition where you have a strict ranking of um, a long-term job being better than a short-term job being better than uh, one of the two not working states. And um, so what they're going to do is to basically try to um, infer these transition probabilities to match as closely as possible, given that agents have this ranking where they'd like to be working if possible, what are the transition probabilities that agents in the data must face that allow us to observe these uh, activity transitions that we see in the data? And this estimation procedure can exactly identify for each of the different types what are these transition probabilities tau between the opportunities that the agents have, which then through the endogenous decision making of the agent is going to imply some transition between activities. Um, and then, as Mariana said, it's going to set identify these different flow values, which will vary uh, by type as well. OK. So the first kind of very provocative finding of the paper is that unemployment is highly concentrated among a small group of the population. So for me, this immediately led me to think, is this a good setting for us to evaluate the, the value of unemployment insurance uh, to these agents, and more generally think about the design of uh, unemployment insurance? So one thing that I think um, is important to recognize about the findings is that the value of um, these mover types, in particular the high U and high N types, fluctuates a lot as they move from not having a job to having a job. So their lifetime value fluctuates a lot over their life cycle. In kind of standard macro models, we think that agents are very averse to this type of fluctuation because, um, because of risk aversion in their preferences. But you notice that there's no risk aversion here in the estimation procedure. So my first concern with using this environment to evaluate unemployment insurance is that we've assumed risk neutrality on the part of, of the agents. My sense is that if you change the Bellman equations to incorporate risk aversion, that would affect the estimation of the tau's and the flow values. Um, but I'm interested to hear Mariana's reaction to that. So I think before using this setting to evaluate unemployment insurance, we would need a more realistic description of agents' preferences. In particular, one of the reasons why we think unemployment insurance is needed is because people really don't like the fact that their consumption fluctuates a lot. The second um, is one of the concerns when we think about unemployment insurance, you know, I think the, the model can t potentially tell us something about how changes in unemployment insurance will affect people's behavior in uh, normal times. But we also think that unemployment insurance is important when the aggregate unemployment rate changes. So one thing about the estimation strategy is that, that it relies on being at the ergodic distribution of the model. Because the Bellman equations have this recursive structure where the tau's don't depend on time and are fixed, um, estimating these requires being at the ergodic distribution of the model. And so the setting isn't particularly, um, at, at first glance, very useful in thinking about, for example, a recession where the aggregate unemployment rate rises and we're away from the er ergodic distribution of the model. So I tried to think a little bit about what a recession would look like in this model. And I think the key question really comes down to how does a re recession affect different types? 
So is it just that the movers, in particular the movers, the high U movers that already experience a lot of unemployment, have an even higher risk of experiencing unemployment? And I think the literature on, um, for example, the incidence of job loss in recessions does point us a little bit towards thinking that it is these marginal workers that, that are, experience an increase in the probability of losing their jobs in a recession. But it could also be that um, a new group of workers, in particular these always E workers that they just kind of assume the existence of in the model, in a recession now experience some risk of job loss that they don't face in normal times. And this would have diff sort of different predictions about how different people in the model care about unemployment insurance. So it looks like in normal times, the benefits of UI really go to a very small group of people, but it leaves open the question of how this changes in recessions. And the estimation framework doesn't allow us to directly think about that. So um, my second comment is also sort of related to this. I think it would be, so, uh, so in the version of the paper that I read, the heterogeneity that's investigated is just by gender. They do this estimation separately for men and women. Um, but you know, it's nice that they're already starting to address this. I thought it would be interesting to investigate the characteristics of the types. They have the CPS data. So there's a bunch of things you can learn about individuals in the CPS data that would help inform our understanding of why some of these people are moving around a lot in labor market activities, and some uh, are very fixed. So some of these reasons could be related to the life cycle. In particular, my prior is that a lot of churn is driven by uh, very young people that are sort of establishing themselves on the job ladder, maybe leaving education and searching for a job for the first time, um, and also potentially by older people who are kind of on the margin between retirement and work. Um, so this may be a reason why individuals actually over their life cycle transition between types. It's not that your type is something that you're born with, but instead there may be life cycle factors that drive you to move across different types. Um, similarly, life events like getting married or having kids can change the value of non-work um, and so may potentially affect the way that people, uh, to the extent that we think people move across types, I think these would be events that would, that would drive that. There are also more permanent characteristics that may correlate with type. So again, I had some priors about how these different, um, these different characteristics might affect how likely an individual is to churn. Um, it's interesting to hear that you, know, the, you can find, you can t discover these, these different types at all, um, education levels, and um, I, I was gonna suggest also looking industry and geographic location. Um, but uh, I think, okay, so, so let me just wrap up this part and then I have a couple more comments about this. Um, so if we turn back to thinking about unemployment insurance, if these are things related to the life cycle and people move across type over the life cycle, this would suggest that, for example, some people enjoy the benefits of unemployment insurance, most people enjoy the benefits of unemployment insurance at some point in their life. And so maybe we shouldn't be so concerned about how concentrated the benefits look at, at one point in time. Um, it, this would also be informative if life cycle factors do matter for the, for the type shares, which uh, gender, for example, does. That is potentially informative about how churn will change over time. If we think that there are changes, for example, population aging or changes in family structure that are slow moving, this model would then deliver some predictions about how churn will change as, um, uh, as the population changes in some dimension. If these other factors seem to be responsible for churn, like education, industry, and the place where people live, then to the extent that we think churn is kind of harmful for agents in this risk-averse um, setup, we may want to use targeted policies, for example, place-based or um, you know, sort of training programs, job you know, programs to match people with jobs in different industry and occupation or retraining programs, et cetera. Um, so, there are these two kind of closely related papers that came out after, uh, just after Mariana and Bob's uh, first draft, which, have, um, which try to investigate exactly these questions. And what they find is most of this unobserved, uh, most of this heterogeneity between types is unobserved. And it sounds like that's the conclusion that Mariana and Bob are reaching as well. Although I would say that, for example, the, the analysis between men and women in the paper is suggestive that gender is predictive of membership to a type. So if you do find that population shares differ, then, then that tells you that actually some, some of these demographic characteristics can be used to predict membership to a type, which then all my previous comments uh, uh, apply. 
One little wrinkle to doing this, which is, wasn't obvious to me at first, um, was that actually what the estimation procedure does is not to go through each worker. And these two other papers do more of like a clustering algorithm that tries to classify individuals by type. This paper takes a different approach where basically they're not going to assign individual workers to a type. They're instead going to use the structural model to replicate these activity paths. And so they're not directly saying this individual in the CPS is this type and so on. But I think ex post they could go through and probabilistically assign workers to types and then generate some um, summary statistics by type on these different observables that I'm interested in. But actually, the paper already points to an alternative strategy if this first strategy isn't feasible, which is just to look within subsamples, re-estimate the model within these subsamples, and then look at the, the population shares within the subsample. Um, OK, so I will just um, stop here and um, look forward to hearing the questions. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Mariana, do you want to quickly? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jane, for very thoughtful comments. And uh, I'll try to, to, to briefly talk about it. So on the estimation, you are absolutely right that when we estimate, we are just saying, OK, there is this distribution of pass in the data. We sent, roughly speaking, five matrices, four by four. And we want the data to tell us what are the parameters of those matrices and the weights. And uh, we got the, number, the answers. So indeed, ex post, when we see the pass of individual worker, let's say EU, EU, we can assign a probability. What is the probability to observe that type, to observe that pass, if he is type, let's say, 1, type 2, type 3, type 5? So that's a, that's a very good suggestion. And we can, and we can definitely do it. Basically, to, to assign a probability that specific pass belongs to one of the types. And then we can grab the observables on that guy and maybe run a regression. Let's say if he is having 50% probability of being this type, what is the observable? So definitely, we can do it. And it's, it's a great suggestion. So that's one. About heterogeneity, whether it's observed and unobserved. Um, unfortunately, I cut the extra slides from my slide deck because, uh, yes, in the, we already did this by education. So basically, we can do this on observables the way we just now described. Or what we did, we just um, constructed a sample sample among women, let's say, or among men by education and re-estimated everything. And so far, we see that, again, the shares among subsamples differ, but the transition matrices and these types that are either heavily in OLF or heavily of, on U, the transition probabilities are quite similar. So more work we can do here to kind of talk about observed heterogeneity, but it looks like a lot of that is not described by our observables like gender, age, education. So roughly speaking, there are some people that you can never catch them, you can never see them unemployed. That doesn't mean they don't lose jobs, but before they lose a job, they already have another lined up. And that would be the EEE type. They just like don't want to be uh, in unemployment. They already line up, the job, line up a job. So that's about heterogeneity. Now you, uh, you mentioned about um, us being us identifying the type from ergodic distribution. And basically, the big question is how all this looks over the business cycle. That uh, we always wanted to do, but we haven't done it yet. And maybe it's um, for next paper for, for us or for other people. Basically, the question is, how do we extend it to the business cycle? Do we put some epsilon to our transition parameters of the matrix? So basically, the transition parameters a uh, little bit differ and maybe specify the structure, but keep the shares of each type fixed? Or do we also allow, as Jane alluded, uh, kind of to allow the types to have some smooth transition from one type to another? We don't yet have an answer to that, but basically that's something that one can look at. And finally, to your first question about unemployment insurance policies, um, we are very well aware that uh, basically more work can be done, should be done, to. Uh, to advise on unemployment insurance. So that's why we don't do policy uh, advice. Here in this paper, we, we, we characterize the data. But um, in terms of risk averse versus risk neutrality in the model, I don't think that if we introduce uh, risk, risk aversion in our, um, in our Bellman values, that will um, 
alter results much because at the end of the day, we identified the ranking of Bellman values and transitions. So as long as this uh, utility from consumption is, so basically um, at the end of the day, we'll be identifying transition rates. And so I, I'm not sure that the risk aversion will help, will, will, will lead to different results in terms of transition matrices. But uh, you're right. So, so how we, we don't write formally the advice about unemployment insurance, but we do think that these guys who uh, switch among labor market activities, they probably have, they have the riskier life and probably they are most likely benefiting, can benefit from unemployment insurance. But more work needs to be done in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Question from the floor. This is a great paper, very interesting. And if you so, can uh, state oh, your name after oh, the Alps and Sake from Yale. Thank you. And this is a comment inspired by the discussions, which uh, I found very helpful. Um, so in, if you observe the past employment, unemployment spells of someone, your model suggests that you can pretty accurately assign them to types. I mean, if someone is moving, has, has in the past moved in and out of unemployment, would be most likely your like U type, mover type. So in that sense, here, unobserved types can be observed if you include the past spells of employment and employment. And that suggests you, know, you could do targeted labor market policies if you include that data, if you sort of uh, keep track of past uh, spells. So, so in that sense, I think this analysis could be very useful for labor market policy going forward. Okay, so basically um, the idea, if I understand, would be if you observe certain paths, one can assign probability. What is the probability to see that specific path if somebody is, let's say, churn type versus if somebody is a high employment type and it's just like one off? Um, I need to think more in terms of any moral hazard issues, but uh, yeah, the path reveals, reveals the types, is what we see. University of Oxford. There, there's something I'm not quite understanding about this claim about unemployment being concentrated amongst types, so maybe you can help me. So imagine if you just did a, a snapshot at any one time of status. You, you'd have some people who'd be employed, some people would be unemployed, and some people would be out of, the, out of the labor market. And you would, of course, by definition, say that unemployment is concentrated amongst the people who are unemployed. That, that's got to be true. I mean, that's in that snapshot sense, it's got to be true. Now, you've got an advantage that you've got 16 months of their tracking of their status. But 16 months is not very long. So aren't you still effectively saying unemployment is concentrated amongst people who happen to be unemployed in that 16-month period? So I'm not surprised that it's concentrated. But maybe I've understood wrong. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is a very good question. So limitation of our data is 16 months. So, um, so first, let me say this: 16 months. Uh, it's uh, it's rather long period for someone to be continuously unemployed. So the fact that already from 16 months we are identifying that some people are more more likely to be in unemployment, and it's only let's say among the sample of men five percent. It's, it's already a sense it is concentrated because the duration of unemployment, and I don't have the exact number from the top of my head, but it's, not, it's much shorter than 16 months. That's, that's, so I think 60, finding the concentration within 16 month spell is already pretty good. But what you, are, what you are going to, I think, and that is very useful, basically it would be nice to look at the long panel where we see individual over 20, 40 years and see what's happening. And there is work um, done uh, maybe 10 years ago um, by Morkio when, they, when he looks at NLSY data. And he finds that when NLSY allows you to, it's like a, almost through the entire life cycle. And basically, I don't exactly remember the numbers, but 10% of uh, unempl most unemployment comes from 10% of individuals. So, but you're right, it would be nice to work with longer panels, and that would be something for future work. One last question. Yeah, Andre Kerman from Drexel. I just want to follow up on this and your answer, Mariana. Um, you know, the unemployment part is interesting, 
but you could just also be more broad and say, who are the people who are not employed, right? And, or move in and out, is it always the same? And if you, if you make it broader, then you could use, for instance, the LEHD, because there you have a much longer panel, yeah. right? I think the CP, I, I agree with you that the, the duration uh, of unemployment is relatively short in the United States, and so you can make, um, you can have some confidence that, uh, about your statesman, but it would be interesting, for instance, to look with, with, with the LEHD, for instance. Thank you, Andre. Great, yeah. great presentation. Thank you, Andre. So this is uh, very useful. Yes, LHD is a, is a longer panel, but it doesn't allow distinguishing between unemployment and out of labor force. So we'll be using you will be one be, will be losing that dimension. And actually, um, one of the papers that Jane cited, Manzio, Wixer, and Gregory, they are using the data, but lose, um, different statistical approach. K k um, clustering an algorithm to identify types. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that data has a longer panel, which is useful, missing one of the dimensions, search versus non-search. But definitely, our method, it very easily can be applied to any data that has some non-Markov structure to identify types. Thank you.